Hey there, Caitlin here from Launch the Damn Thing. I wanted to talk about what elements go into making a really user-friendly blog homepage on Squarespace 7.1. So let's go ahead and dive right in. This is a demo site that I made just to show you some examples of the types of things that I'm talking about here and so that I can actually show you how to set this up. <laughs> First of all, we have a home blog page. We're not in any of the individual entries, in other words, on 7.1 in Squarespace. The thing that's different about 7.1 versus the older version, which is 7.0, is that you have the added capability of putting extra sections on top or below the actual blog feed. So everything in the middle here will automatically update um, just like it does in 7.0, but the difference is you can style the page a bit further. And that's what I wanted to show you today. This demo site doesn't have any plugins. So everything that you see here, you're fully capable of doing this even if you're not a pro. And I wanted to show you how I achieved these things time to dive into your blog page settings. So this actually applies to the entire blog page and you can actually adjust how many posts show up in the feed on this page. Under the settings for the blog page, which you can get to from this window or from your main pages window by clicking that gear wheel and then going into your general settings for the blog page, scrolling down and then adjusting the slider for the posts per page. Now I have a plugin that gives me the lazy summaries, which is part of squarewebsites.org and the Pro Tools extension. I have it disabled right now, but it looks like it's still showing the actual maximum that I think Squarespace will allow is between 20 and 25 per page. But right now I have it set on 10. So you can actually adjust that slider to about 20. And I don't have 20 posts in this list, but I took it down to 10 just so I could show you what the built-in pagination is like, but you can change that number. And that's just what controls how many show up in the feed right here from the main blog page. So you can adjust that while you're in there. You also want to make sure that your page title, your page navigation title, which is just what shows up in the actual navigation areas of your website, the blog URL makes sense. You also want to select a SEO title, SEO description for this particular page. If the collection by chance is something that you're using for internal purposes, like a testimonial section or something like that, you don't really want people to be here. You can hide all the pages in this collection from Google so it will not crawl these. Otherwise, leave those toggles off because you do want Google to crawl if it's content marketing related like blog posts podcast show notes, YouTube show notes, and the like. You can also set a social image for the blog as a whole, and that would be the fallback if you don't set one per post and there's no thumbnail for the blog. And then you can also set a feed. So if you want to replace your RSS feed for the blog itself, you can set that up with feed burner and put that in here. You can also link up your podcast feed so that wherever you're hosting your podcast, whether it's Podbean or Buzzsprout or whatever, you get an RSS feed for the podcast there and you can paste that in uh, down here under the change link and all of that. So you can set up the podcast to be posted in your blog through Squarespace if you want to. There's also some advanced settings in here. So once you get your blog going and you realize you need to edit a category or a tag that already exists, you do not have to do that in individual posts. You can go in here and edit. So if you wanted that to be capitalized, for example, instead of lowercase, you can change it from within here and it will update in all the posts where it exists. There we go. If I wanted to delete any of these, I could do that as well by selecting groups of them. I can merge them or delete them when there are more than one selected. So that's a good thing to know. Same thing for your tags. You can go in here and click any of the tags and edit. So if I wanted to capitalize that the way that it's intended to be, save for example, or I can delete it if I wanted to combine if I wanted to combine two, I could merge success stories with inspiration. 
and then call it inspiration because maybe I already have a category called success stories and I don't need a tag that also says that. So there we go. Now we have a new tag called inspiration and it will be applied to any post that had the old tags that I had selected before, which was inspiration and success stories. <laughs> so it's a good thing to know. Also, if you have a really long list of these, like I do now in my current company blog page, you can filter through this tag by typing some word to look for a thing and it'll filter through the list to help you find it. So that's good to know because tags especially can get pretty lengthy. If you have any page code that's specific to your blog collection, you might have some in your header code or your blog item code injection. If not, you can completely ignore those. That is all of your blog page settings. Now let's jump into the actual page design layout and the post settings themselves. First and foremost, you want this page to be super user friendly. Otherwise, people aren't going to stick around. The one thing that Squarespace doesn't do right out of the box really well is make this page user friendly <laughs> in that like all you really get is as you fill this up, you get this bottom pagination, which is automatic, but it just says older and newer posts. That's it. So if I click older posts, it cycles to the page number two and it should load and say newer posts if I go backwards, but that's not great, right? Cause you don't know how many pages of content there are. The way around that is to create your own additional section on top of it. First of all, you need to be able to put in what this page type is and what kind of information it will host. So I usually do some sort of combination of both things because Google doesn't necessarily need to know that this is a blog. It just needs to know the type of content. So I put that there for other people's purposes. Um, and then this is of course, just the title of the content type that goes here. Beneath that, we have an archive block and you'll notice this section is actually using Fluid Engine, but it can be achieved very easily also in Classic Editor. So if you have one or the other, you can do this on both. Let me just show you what that actually looks like here. So we change the color. Let's do something slightly different and let's make it narrow so we can copy, paste, <laughs> a little bit different because I'm in a different color theme down here, but same concept applies. We can also do the archive block. We can also filter it to the blog data, and we can also do a list filtering. Let's do centered, and we're going to only show categories, and we're going to show the group count. So that's how I achieved this block. And you can, as you can see, do that in Classic Editor or in Fluid Engine, either or. And then if you want to also add the drop down for the year, that is another archive block. We're going to again choose the blog to filter content from. We're going to set the display layout to drop down and we're going to rename it year because archive is just not a very sexy word to use there. We're going to group the contents in the drop down by year and we're going to sort the dates ascending and show the group count. And then we're going to drag in classic editor this over next to the list. And then we're going to add one more block, the search block, and we're going to search this page specifically, just in case you have additional search blocks on the rest of your site, like in your footer, for example, that's always a great place to put one. <laughs> and you can set the display to whatever best fits the color theme of your choice. So in this case, the dark version will work better. And I always like to have that quick preview on because that's just a user friendly thing. So if I just drag that over next to the year, and make the year a little bit smaller. Then we actually have links to the press category, the success story category, and the tips category with a count for how many articles are in each one. And then they also have the drop down for the year. If I save that change, you can see how this actually looks. Year, there are three posts from 2019, one from 2020. I highly encourage you to post way more often than this demo is showing. <laughs> <laughs> and eight posts for 2022. The way this actually works is Squarespace has a URL for the blog, which is in this case, just blog. 
So that's this right here. And then if you click on any of these categories, the URL becomes blog backslash category backslash press in this case. And so each of the categories have their own URL. So what it's doing when someone clicks on that is it's reloading the page, but it's actually what it's actually doing is taking them to the link that shows only the content assigned to that category. It's very similar in the shop, works in both places actually. As you can see, you do not need a paid filter for this to work. <laughs> Although I always recommend the squarewebsites.org universal filter plugin. That's what's on my blog, but I also have well over a hundred posts in there now. And um, as the content grew, it made more sense for me to have better filtration system. <laughs> I didn't install that universal filter on my blog for years honestly. So, and I was on a semi-regular schedule for most of that time, posting every other week and then posting once a week, which I didn't start until 2020. So for the past two years, um, I had more of a system like this and only installed the universal filter in the last few months. So you can get by with the free tools built into Squarespace for a long time before you need anything else. And really you don't ever need anything else. That's just my personal preference. So that's how you can build this section. And then what I encourage you to do is to add one more beneath it that could display who's talking in the posts, whether it's podcasting and those are your show note posts or whether it's articles, whether it's YouTube videos and these are show notes for the YouTube videos, whatever it is, it's always good to have a little blurb at the bottom, especially if most of your traffic is coming to your blog from Google because they haven't met you yet. They don't know who you are. <laughs> they don't know why they should stick around. And if you put a little blurb here that explains that and redirects them to your about page, maybe they'll get to know you a little bit and learn about you. And um, you might get a couple extra fans. <laughs> so what I did for this particular section is I actually just scrolled up here. Now you can do this with Canva very easily. In fact, I encourage you to actually do it that way instead because you'll get a better image. But what I did for the sake of this tutorial is I literally just grabbed a screenshot of this color difference right there. So I saved that screenshot to my computer. Then I came in here to edit mode. And as the background for this section, I uploaded that screenshot and I moved the focal point up to the top. I turned the overlay opacity all the way off so that this should be really close to that color. It should show like, well, right now it's kind of a blurry <laughs> transition, but if you export a similar image from Canva, you'll get a much cleaner line right here and it'll look a lot more like these blocks are overlapping this section, which is really neat. So it's a fun interactive way to do that. And then of course, I just have a text block with a heading three and a little fake blurb. If I refresh the page, I have the button overlapping the text block, which is overlapping the image. The effect can be achieved in a classic editor section with the image layout. So I'll show you what that looks like in case you're on classic editor. So if we upload that image, the upload file, drag it up near the top. Oh, I did it backwards. Okay. So we need to edit. I'm going to flip this and do custom and drag it down. There we go. Save. Yes. Okay. So now it's going to change that image. There we go. A little bit blurrier than the other one before. We want to make sure we adjust that overlay opacity all the way to zero because we want this color to be as close to this color as possible. And again, I do recommend that you actually do this in Canva so that you get a clearer line here and a better resolution image. But like I said, just for the purposes of this tutorial, I just did it that way. Okay. We want to add an image. We want to choose the collage. We're going to do image on right. And we're going to make sure we have the right section color. This is bright one. So this should be bright one. There we go. So we have the right background color. 
and then we can grab the text from here, paste it in, and then there we go. And then for the image, we're just going to grab one from the media library, which should be right here. There we go. Then we're going to set the link to button. And what did we say? Learn more? Well, that's that's not a very interesting call to action, but uh, we'll just say, oops, meet Devin. And you can go to the about page to learn more about fake Devin if you want to. <laughs> there we go. One last thing, if we edit the height down to nothing, or almost nothing, that's as little as you can get in Classic Editor. So now we have the smallest section that we can, and it's mimicking as closely as possible that I can do really quickly <laughs> to the Fluid Engine version, which is a little bit different, but you still have the same effect, right? The only difference is the button, and that's something that you can style with CSS. Um, I'm not sure if you can dictate primary, secondary, or tertiary buttons on image layouts in, in a classic editor without custom CSS. But regardless, you have the same effect happening in both editors in 7.1. So with that in mind, <laughs> Those are all the things that I suggest that you do for your blog. As far as page layout and structure goes, my top tips for creating better organization in your actual blog content is to make sure you always, always, always go through the tabbed list in the blog post settings when you post new things. So in the content section, putting a thumbnail image in there, you can skip the excerpt because a lot of times that messes with the ability to turn on or off the read more link. If you want the read more link, but not show the excerpt, Unfortunately, in summary blocks, you have to have the excerpt showing for the read more link to be there. But if you leave the excerpt empty, in this case, it can be on and not show anything. So I always leave that empty. Change your post URL, make it something readable. In this case, this is just an example for a post like this one, productivity tips or whatever it is. <laughs> make sure you change the author if there are more people working on the blog than just yourself. And then you go into options, you can set your status for the post, you need to set your tags. Those are things that are specific to the content that are in that post. So these are not broad topics, these are like specific. Um, so in that post, if it's talking about productivity tips and my favorite tools, then it would make sense in that case to talk about Squarespace, ClickUp, ConvertKit, QuickBooks, Dubsado, Novo, Ember, that's my coffee mug, that's like my fifth limb. <laughs> So those are the specific things that I might mention in that post, but for the categories, it would just be tips or just be productivity or something much more broad. Um, and then turn on your comments if you want people to be able to comment, and then go over to your SEO. And this is where you can put what could have been in the excerpt under content. You can stick that in here and it's also an extra opportunity for you to insert natural keyword phrases that are related to any product or service that you offer and also help people find your content for this blog post on Google. It gives you a limit. It'll tell you what your word count is or how many characters you have left. And then your SEO title, usually what I do here is to do some sort of variation on whatever the actual title is. So if the title was um, productivity tips, my favorite tools and whatever, if that's what the title of the actual post is, then for the SEO title, I might say something slightly different, like my favorite productivity tools and software of 2022, same concept but worded differently so that I can try to target both and maybe having different sets of keywords that are along the same line that are like adjacent to each other. <laughs> That's the theory behind the way that I set that up. And then I also choose a social preview image. So when the link is shared on social media, like on Facebook, for example, you have an image associated with that particular post. And then if you have platforms connected to your website, like Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Google Search Console, that's another one that, that's new to this area. 
when you have that connected, you can enable or disable the, the sharing. So basically when Squarespace publishes your blog post, it can also push the title and the link to that post to any of those platforms, which is great if you have Google Search Console connected because Squarespace can tell Google there's a new post to crawl and it'll do so immediately as opposed to waiting around and finding it like five months later. <laughs> So an example of that might be settings for a recent blog post that I posted recently. I have the featured image. I do not have an excerpt. I have a post URL. I'm the only author. And then if I come over to options, I had it set to schedule the post for me. So now it's published. I have tags set for that post. So you can see these are all specific things related to the content in that particular post. They're not broad topics. And then in the categories, I have video because I had a video in the post and I had Squarespace tips because it was a Squarespace specific tip. So those are both broad things that cover a wide range and that's what you want your categories to be. So always, 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 always have tags and categories on your blog post. It'll help you as you get further down the road and scale your blog as a whole. I just cannot, like, it's such a pain in the ass to have to go back and do this after the fact. So just make sure you're doing it well from the get-go and you will be so thankful later. I also always have comments on by default, so I just make sure that's on. And then in the SEO settings, I did not do a description for this one, but I did do an external, like, additional title. So you'll notice um, I had something like speed up your workflow, and this one, I put 10 Squarespace shortcuts to speed up your workflow. Same concept, but worded slightly differently. And then, of course, you know, I skipped the SEO description. <laughs> don't do what I'm doing. <laughs> for the social image, I don't have a social image for this particular blog post, but often it'll pick up the thumbnail image. So I just have that one set. And then for the share, this is what I'm talking about here. So I have my Twitter account connected, my Google search account connected, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Pinterest. Then I have Instagram linked, but the difference between linked and connected is that a link is literally just a link to that page like these three are, but these are actually connections. So Squarespace can push data to these places for me if I want to. So when I posted this, I enabled the connection to Google Search Console so that I could tell Google I had a new post. I chose not to push to LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest just because I'm lazy. <laughs> But you could definitely turn this on just by selecting push to Twitter. It tells you what it's going to say. The variable field for that is the title. And in this case, the URL, you could also do the author if there are multiple authors. That is about it. I don't think it'll let you actually type a description of any kind in there. So you're limited in that regard, which is one of the reasons why I don't tend to use it. If I'm going to post my blog on these platforms, I use something like Planoly instead. But I do use the Google Search Console because I want Google to know that this post exists right away. And I don't want to have to worry about um, Google waiting maybe six months or three weeks <laughs> to find it later than I've posted originally. So those are my big tips for the settings per post and some tips about how to lay out the actual blog. So on 7.0, I used to say that you could create something like this with a series of summary blocks, but on 7.1, you really don't need that anymore. If you just follow the tips that I gave you for this blog homepage, you'll have something super user-friendly that people can navigate and they can search through your content a lot easier and hopefully stick around a lot longer. <laughs> so that's it for today's post. If it helps you, leave a comment below and I'll see you next time. <laughs>